Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Amit Harari. And coming up in today's newscast, controversy as Israel marks the 27th anniversary of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. Meantime, world leaders and thousands of delegates from around the globe are arriving in Egypt for the COP27 climate summit. And then an American TikTok star launching a new series about the Holocaust with hopes to raise global awareness. It's been 27 years since Prime Minister, General and Statesman Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated by Igal Amir and Israel is commemorating the late leader of Jerusalem on Sunday, the anniversary of his murder. ILTV's Aaron Poor is with the story. Israelis solemnly marking the 27th anniversary of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin's assassination on Sunday with official commemorations and memorials at the Knesset and presumptive incoming Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu condemning the assassination as a nauseating attack on democracy while urging for unity across the aisles in the wake of these divisive serial elections, comments mirroring that of his outgoing counterpart, Yair Lapid. צריך לדעת על מה כן להסכים, על מה כן אנחנו רובנו מסכימים. אני מאמין שישנם נושאי ליבה שלגביה, שלגביהם הגענו במידה רבה להסכמה לאומית בשנים הללו שחלפו. יש הסכמה רחבה שמדינת ישראל הייתה ותהיה מדינת הלאום של העם היהודי. ישראל היא מדינה שבה זכויות אזרח שמורות לכולם, בלי יוצא מן הכלל. אנחנו פה יחד. דתיים וחילונים וימנים ושמאלנים ואנשי מרכז, חילוקי הדעות הם אמיתיים, הם עמוקים, לפעמים הכרחיים, אבל מעל הכל יש לנו אחריות משותפת. אין שום טעם באזכרה הזאת, אין שום טעם ביום הזה אם לא נלמד מזה משהו, אם לא נפיק את הלקח. הדבר שעלינו ללמוד מחייו ומותו של יצחק רבין הוא שאהבת מולדת היא קודם כל ולפני הכל. אהבת האנשים שחיים איתך באותה מולדת. But the official ceremony marred by controversy when far-right religious Zionism MK Betzele Smotrich took to the podium. Smotrich first lamented Rabin's murder, saying it was an act that crossed every red line of a democratic society. But he then went on to argue that his objections to Rabin's policies at the time and today are no more than the essence of such a democracy, not incitement. Now this in and of itself is not really cause for controversy. What was found to be particularly offensive was when Smotrich blamed the Shin Bet, Israel's premier security organization, with encouraging Rabin's murder. <laughs> ומי שכשל בשמירה על ראש הממשלה יצחק רבין הם לא אנשי הימין והציונות הדתית, הם לא המתנחלים שזעקו בצדק נגד מדיניות ראש הממשלה והממשלה שבראשותו, אלא שירותי הביטחון שלא רק שכשלו בשמירה עליו, אלא גם השתמשו במניפולציות חסרות אחריות שעד היום לא נחשפו במלואן כדי לעודד את הרוצח לבצע את זממו. Essentially, Smotrich saying that the Shin Beit used manipulations to goad right-wing extremist Yigal Amir to follow through with his plan. This in reference to a later acquitted Shin Beit agent who had infiltrated Amir's circle but failed to prevent the attack. By contrast to Smotrich, meantime, sources in the security agency decrying the MK's conspiracy theories that promote extremist discourse. It's been five days since the election Malders declared victory of the right in the elections and three days after the official results confirmed it, but the President of the United States, Joe Biden, still has not called to congratulate his old friend, Benjamin Netanyahu. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, did not call either. American officials said that Biden is expected to talk with Netanyahu in the coming days and have different views on why it still hasn't happened. 
Some say Biden is focused on the party's effort to win the midterm elections, which are being held tomorrow in the USA. However, a former senior official in the political system believes that this is an excuse and that the delay in conversation is no accident. According to him, Netanyahu took a few good days to congratulate Biden on his election victory against Trump in 2020. And he only did so when it became clear beyond any doubt that Trump had indeed lost in the U.S. Most of the congratulations have so far come from the Republican side of the map. Welcome back, Netanyahu. You've been missed, tweeted former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, while Senator Rick Scott said of Netanyahu, a strong leader and a good friend of America. What a wonderful day for Israel and the USA. The Allenby Bridge border crossing between Israel and Jordan is now open 24-7. A trial run of the expanded hours is testing staffing capabilities and the terminal where Palestinians often face long delays when traveling abroad or returning home. Here are the details. The expansion of hours at the Allenby Bridge between Israel and Jordan following coordination with the U.S. administration. The launch was pushed back several times, drawing criticism from Washington, which announced over the summer that the facility would begin running around the clock by September. The initiative was included in a package of steps unveiled by the U.S. and Israel aimed at improving Palestinian travel. The Transportation Ministry had announced that the trial would launch on October 24, but the start date was pushed off when the chairman of the airport's authority objected to a rollout at the end of an election campaign. The Allenby crossing is currently open from 8 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Queues to cross into Jordan can last hours or up to an entire day, creating inconvenience for Palestinians who can have a difficult time receiving permits to fly out of Ben Gurion Airport. As a result, most Palestinians cross the Allenby Bridge and fly in and out of Amman. World leaders and thousands of delegates from around the globe are arriving in the Egyptian resort of Sharm el-Sheikh for the COP27 climate summit. President Yitzhak Herzog is leading a large Israeli delegation and Israeli climate innovation events are planned. ILTV Steve Leibovitch reports. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Opportunity for world leaders to show solidarity and take concerted action when and where needed most. Much of this year's focus is expected to relate to loss and damage wrought by climate change with wealthy... Excellencies, this UN climate conference is a reminder that the answer is in our hands. And the clock is ticking. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising. And our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. Inaction is myopic and can only defer climate catastrophe. Inclusion of this agenda reflects a sense of solidarity and empathy with the suffering of the victims of climate-induced disasters. And to this end... Friends, we are not currently on a pathway that keeps 1.5 in reach. And whilst I do understand that leaders around the world have faced competing priorities this year, we must be clear, as challenging as our current moment is, inaction is myopic and can only defer climate catastrophe. Inclusion of this agenda reflects a sense of solidarity and empathy with the suffering of the victims of climate-induced disasters. And to this end, we all owe a debt of gratitude to activists and civil society organizations who have persistently demanded a space to discuss funding for loss and damage and thus provided the impetus needed to bring this matter forward. Hundreds of Israelis led by President Isaac Herzog are attending this year's Global Climate Conference. Dozens of Israeli climate innovation events are planned, many around what will be Israel's first national pavilion in the history of the global confab's 27 years. It is also the first Israeli pavilion of its kind on Egyptian soil since a 1985 business conference in Cairo. A year ago, then Prime Minister Naftali Bennett pledged that Israel would reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Bennett made his commitment just before COP26 in Glasgow alongside Energy Minister Karin el Harar. Israel decided against the government decision on the matter ahead of the elections. 
Attempts earlier this year to get the net zero commitment included in the climate bill failed, primarily because of finance ministry opposition. The bill did pass its first reading, committing Israel to reducing emissions by 85% by 2050. Net zero refers to a situation in which a country effectively reduces its emissions to zero. This can be done by investing in projects that reduce emissions or that absorb carbon dioxide from the air and either use it in industry or convert it into a form that can be buried for a long time. The 2015 Paris Agreement commits all signatories, including Israel, to reach carbon neutrality in emissions during the second half of the 21st century. Hundreds of Israelis will be attending this year's conference, which officially opened this afternoon. Joining us straight from the Egyptian heat is Times of Israel environment reporter Sue Serkis. Hi, Sue. Good to have you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, Sue. Please describe to us what will be happening in these two weeks, who and what are expected to see at the conference. First of all, uh, something like 50,000 people are expected, plus between 90 and 100 world leaders, including Joe Biden, uh, but not Xi Jinping of China and not India's Narendra Modi. Of course, those, those are two of the countries with the biggest emissions. Um, our President Herzog arrived this morning and is already meeting with other leaders. Uh, there's a very large Israeli delegation, including four actually outgoing ministers. Um, the activity here is really split between three areas, uh, between a blue zone, which is for accredited people like ministers and officials and the media and what have you. And there, there are a lot of pavilions, including the first Israeli pavilion ever at a COP event, and actually the first one on Egyptian soil for 37 years. There's a green zone for NGOs, and there are many, many Israelis there. And a third area has opened this year, which is called the Climate Action Innovation Zone. Now, all of these have numerous pavilions, each running loads and loads of activities over the conference, which goes through to the 18th of November. So it's quite difficult to choose uh, what to go to. Um, the conference officially opened yesterday. It'll only really get going um, tomorrow. And really, the, the, the emphasis can be felt here on the developing nations as very much... Uh, the events are very much directed at the developing uh, the developing nations. One of the issues, for example, is loss and damage, which is how to compensate the developing nations for the disasters that are befalling them uh, as a result of climate change, which was really caused by, you know, the industrial revolution and the activities of the richer Western nations. So there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of hard bargaining and hard discussions here. Uh, yes. I think there's limited, uh, limited optimism in terms of what the outcomes are going to be. I'd like to ask you also, everyone on earth is sending representatives and it seems that they would all agree on all of it. So what's the uphold? I mean, what are the big questions at the heart of the negotiations there? Well, the big questions as, al uh, as always are how far countries are willing to go to cut their carbon emissions and they're just not willing to go far enough. You know, the the uh, the uh, the, um, the scientists have said that for for us to remain within 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, increase in temperature compared with pre-industrial uh, times, for that to happen, we need to cut uh, carbon emissions by something like 45 percent by 2030. It's just not happening. You know, we've got the war in Ukraine with Russia uh, using its natural gas as a bargaining tool so that all the time uh, now there's a massive scramble on to produce more gas, to produce more oil and to mine more coal so that emissions are going up and will continue to go up for some time. Um, there, isn't really, uh, there isn't really much to be terribly optimistic about at the moment, although you know people always say that there's still a window of hope uh, and there are still things that can be done uh, now Israel's take on this is uh, is technology that that we have a we as Israel have a there's a really key role big Israeli in. delegation this time we see there's a huge Israeli what? delegation yeah why is it uh, so important delegation. why is it so important for Israel well, this time I think it's important for two reasons first of all Israel believes that it has a uh, a real contribution to make in terms of its climate tech uh, so that if I counted correctly there are going to be I think 39 uh, organizations here that are either um, climate tech companies or VP investors or other sorts of organizations 
the pavilion has uh, will be showcasing 10 tech companies uh, and then there's other events going on uh, in and around there's a major um, a major business event that's going on tomorrow uh, which will be hosted by the Israel Export Institute with the Economy Ministry's Foreign Trade Administration, the Foreign Ministry, and the Israeli Manufacturers Association. And they'll be looking at, well, they will be looking at 39 uh, or presenting 39 different organizations. So plus the 10 at the pavilion, it's, it's 49, nearly 50 altogether. There's a lot of officials coming in from lots of ministries coming in for different parts of the conference, which goes on until November the 18th. As I said, there are four ministers here. Uh, academics, scientists, um, businessmen, you name it. Uh, yes. I don't have an exact figure because I wasn't able to get an exact figure, but many, many dozens, certainly. So just one quick question. How optimistic are you this time? In one sentence. Let's say cautiously to look on the bright side. Thank you very much for being with us, Sue. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. The leader of the Anti-Defamation League has expressed alarm over billionaire Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter, warning that the social media platform could turn into a hotbed of hate and extremism. Steve Leibovich reports. Elon Musk took charge of the Twitter platform last weekend, wrapping up the $44 billion deal to purchase the social media giant after bristling over restrictions on misinformation and hate speech. ADL leader Jonathan Greenblatt is troubled about Musk's plans that could allow much more hate speech. Although Twitter has been sending mixed signals, Musk does not appear to be actually trying to stop the hate speech. ADL has suggested an advertiser's boycott, and the world's richest man is upset that he's losing money from canceled advertising. Yeah, content moderation policies have not changed uh, at, at Twitter, and, and it, it is... Um, not, not okay to engage in hateful conduct uh, on, on Twitter. Recently, I had a lot of difficulty with um, uh, activist groups uh, pressuring uh, major advertisers to stop spending money on Twitter. Um, this is despite us doing everything possible to appease them um, and to make it clear that moderation rules and hateful conduct rules have not changed uh, and we're continuing to enforce them um, the, a, a number of major advertisers have stopped spending on Twitter. Um, so this, but this is, this doesn't seem right because um, we've made no change in our operations at all. Greenblatt noted that Musk's takeover came as Jewish groups marked the fourth anniversary of the deadly Tree of Life synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, with anti-Semitism once again in the headlines due to rapper Kanye West's anti-Semitic comments on social media. A note from Musk to Twitter advertisers appeared to mark a shift away from his push for unbridled speech. Musk now says that Twitter cannot become a free-for-all hellscape where anything can be said with no consequences. Telegram, Gab, Parler, Rumble, and other platforms that refuse to address incitement and slander have become hotbeds for radicalism and hate. Greenblatt expressed optimism over Musk's signaled reversal, but warned that ultimately Mr. Musk will be judged by his actions, not his words. Social media sensation Montana Tucker is proudly owning her heritage with an educational docu-series on TikTok with that subject, the Holocaust. The TikTok series named How to Never Forget follows the 29-year-old Tucker as she discovers more about the Holocaust and her personal connection to the genocide while visiting Poland. The series is made up of two-minute segments and educates teenagers about the six million Jews who were murdered by the Nazis during World War II. It also sheds, sheds lights on Polish families who put their lives in danger to save Jews in order to inspire viewers and motivate them to be upstanders and give them hope. Tucker further stated that this has been her responsibility to do this for her, her grandparents, and everyone else that her goals to educate Gen Z about the events, along with hopefully changing other people's perspectives as well. This all while her series has been viewed by millions worldwide so far. And now let's shift focus to the Elephant Brokerage. The Israeli-owned global platform serves as secondary market for private tech shares, and it was declared to be one of the top 100 innovative companies in Europe in 2016. Joining us now with more is Chaim Schiff, co-founder of the Elephant Brokerage. Chaim, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. 
So tell us more about the elephant. What does it mean to be a secondary marketplace, actually? Secondary marketplace is where sellers of private tech companies, the biggest companies, the biggest names in the world, who have been sitting on these shares for sometimes even 10 years, and they want to meet the money. And these companies take a longer time for them to go public. It can now take 12 years, 15 years. They want to see, uh, um, they want to buy a house. They want to buy a new car. Um, on the other hand, and, and they understand that right now it, it's going to take some time. On the other hand, investors from all over the world read about these names every day in the news. They see the great progress, the great value, and they want to take a bite out of this, and they can't because even when these companies raise funds in a funding round, you don't have access to it. So our marketplace is basically a meeting point for them to meet each other and for the sellers to sell the shares to the investors who want to tap into these great companies. And how, see, how do you see the current market sentiment in private tech companies in light of the challenging public market? So obviously when you know, the public market is, has a negative sentiment, it affects the private companies as well. Uh, it goes hand in hand, but the process there takes a longer time. On the other hand, we're seeing that the sellers adapted to it very quickly. The pricing has adjusted very quickly. They understand that they need to give the protection that the investors are looking for. The investors, on the other hand, understand that there are great opportunities for them to get on you know, the cap table and join these great companies, access that companies were not willing to, to give beforehand. Um, and so for, for them, this is a great opportunity. So we're, we're happy because we have a decade-long experience in this market. We're seeing things going back to basics. And for us, this is a good, a good, a good uh, shift. And do you see any difference in the approach of tech companies towards secondary transactions? Yes, absolutely. Um, these companies have gotten used to the idea that they need to give liquidity solutions to their early shareholders, to their employees before they go public. It also takes the pressure off of them to go public. During the last few years, they had two channels, which were when they raised funds, some of it went to uh, secondary transactions. And the other way for them was to go public, and a lot of companies actually went public. Um, public markets are closed right now until further notice. Uh, when investors want to come in and invest in the companies, they want the money to go and be used by the companies to work and not to give liquidity to, uh, to their employees or to early investors. So the companies understand that they need to be more cooperative and more collaborative with secondary solutions. And we're seeing that you know, a lot of times now, companies are actually approaching us to build a liquidity program for them. Yes, and Chaim, looking at people who aren't very familiar with these subjects and in general, what do you offer people who want to buy stocks but they feel like they can't? I mean, do you have anything to offer them? That's a great question. I mean, we've, we're meeting with investors all the time. And a lot of times they say, you know, we understand the potential. We're seeing these great companies. How do we know to pick, you know, the right ones? So for them, we're launching right now a secondary, an institutional grade secondary uh, fund. We've put together an amazing investment committee with an investment experts with great experience. And for them, this could be a great opportunity to diversify their portfolio, to have professional people uh, uh, run these uh, uh, investments for them, and that can be a right, a right solution for them. So we're calling them to come and do it. It's At, a great solution. In due time. Thank you very much, Chaim, for being with us. Thanks, Amit. Let's take a look at the weather forecast. The forecast calling for partly cloudy skies this evening with lows averaging around 14 degrees Celsius or 57 Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow we can expect top temperatures of 23 degrees Celsius or 74 Fahrenheit along with scattered showers around most of the country. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our website, ILTV.TV and subscribe to our newsletter as well as our streaming platform, ILTV+. I'm Amita Rari, be well and thank you so much for watching.
Nancy Manuel Kadosh. I wanted to invite you all to subscribe to ILTV Plus, where you can find our daily news and updates about Israel. And not only that, but live feeds, entertainment, our kosher food show, and so much more. Needless to say, your subscription to ILTV Plus helps us grow and create more content while also supporting the state of Israel. Our app is available on all platforms and devices, so I'll see you guys there.